Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm the kind of person that likes to walk around a lot. Um, so if you see me on various different bits, then don't be surprised. Uh, I also get quite excited by serverless technologies, um, which might be a little bit uh, strange within a tech company and uh, tech situation, but that's OK. A um, little bit about me. I am a uh, CTO. I've been a consultant CTO for many years. Um, and I uh, chose to join a company uh, called Movivo, which you will probably not have heard of. Um, because we work primarily in uh, the developing world and in emerging economies um, rather than in the Western world. So we don't really talk about what we do. Um, but we have been using a serverless approach for uh, 21 months now, so nearly two years. Um, and we've been using uh, AWS Lambda and doing um, a bunch of things around those technologies to, to try and make them work as a back end. Uh, Movivo is, is actually a very small tech company. So there's um, five of us at present. We're just about to scale up to nine. Uh, we're looking for various different people at the moment, but uh, it's quite difficult because you can't really put on a job description we're hiring for serverless people because they don't really exist yet. Um, but we uh, have various different uh, large um, deployments, uh, mainly on AWS Lambda, um, which is... Uh, we have, so let's, quick, quick aside, we have one EC2 instance in our entire stack, uh, and we had uh, half a million monthly active users last month. So we kind of, if you imagine that we don't have the kind of normal world that you live in, then uh, you're probably right. When we started, I started, it was Greenfield. There was, wasn't anything there in terms of servers. And uh, the project started um, with an Android app and, and lots of ideas, but very little else. And I kind of came on board and said, well, I know that there's this technology called AWS Lambda, and I think it's pretty cool. Um, and the, uh, everyone else was kind of looking at me going, I don't know what you're talking about. This doesn't make any sense to anybody. Why don't you just do it the normal way? Uh, you know, Django, Rails, Heroku, or something like that. And we kind of uh, jostled around that for about a day before I went, I want to do it my way. Um, now, just a quick aside um, again. Now, serverless technologies is a kind of catch-all term uh, for various um, provided function-based services. It's not the only thing. Uh, is, it's not just Lambda. There's lots of other ways of doing it. Um, but my context is AWS Lambda, because that's what I know. It's not to say that there aren't better ways or different ways of doing these things and uh, different approaches that might work. So all I can do is give you my experience and talk about that. Um, so if you want to leave now, that's my answer to the question, which is when you should use serverless technologies. Um, you, maybe there's a little bit of a kind of you could, but I think that if you look at the idea of what a cloud native is now, and if you look at the idea of how people are evolving their use of technology within uh, startups and within larger organizations and where things are going, I think we're all going to be looking at things like AWS Lambda, Function as a Service, over the next few years as being where we're all going to end up. I think we are still in a kind of pioneer phase at the moment. Uh, it seems like it's a long way away, but it's actually things can be done now, but there are some issues with it. So um, what I'm going to do with this talk is explain what I see as a serverless approach. It may not be what you think it is. Uh, it may be exactly what you think it is. I don't know. But uh, we're going to talk about what the serverless approach looks like. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the scenarios where you could and couldn't use it. They kind of come at the end, and they're, they're like the last five slides. So you know, we'll get there. But we kind of need to talk a little bit about the technology, because it's a, it's a term that nobody really understands. Um, so when you start looking at serverless, one of the things is kind of quite obvious. You don't have servers, or you sort of do. It's just somebody else's. Um, but you replace the idea of a server and of something that runs some code with function as a service, which is what FAS means. Um, and you also, instead of having maybe containers or instances or, or using relational databases, um, you actually 
you intentionally use services instead of running your own. That's kind of the, the, the whole purpose of serverless, is to kind of remove the, the need to manage and maintain anything and utilize the skills that exist in the cloud providers and everywhere else. Um, and there are, there are various other elements. So often you're, you're looking at it being event-driven. Uh, Lambda is run by events, um, and it's kind of the key to uh, running systems uh, there in the first place. So it's, a, it's an interesting, different way of thinking about it. You automatically have to think distributed. It's a different approach to let's run this code in this little box, and we'll call it a container. It's, it's a different way to think about it. It's inherently more scalable. So, well, it's inherently as scalable as your cloud provider or your system can allow. Um, but it, it's because it's distributed and because it's contained in different ways, you actually end up with a more scalable system. Uh, and the bottom one's actually quite an interesting one. Um, we actually have come to the realization probably in the last week or two that going down a serverless route is more about ops than it is about dev. And actually, you need the devs to think much more as ops in the DevOps world than you uh, need them to be developers. So it actually changes the kind of people that are approaching this and the kind of people that you should take on to do these kinds of projects. And it also changes your focus in the way that you have to approach the problem. Um, I also would say it's, as I, I think I said before, it's, it's the bleeding edge. It's really right at the edge of being what we would call cloud native, which is why I think it fits for this, uh, for this talk and for this uh, track. Um, I kind of would say that because, you know, I like to think I'm always at the cutting edge, um, but I'm not always. Uh, but it is um, where we're going as a, as a, uh, a cloud native group. So one of the other ways I explain to um, people what serverless is, is it's kind of super advanced cloud. You're actually basically diving all in and going, we're going to use functions, we're going to use events, and we're going to use every single service we can to avoid having to do some of the ops problems we have now. That's kind of how I try and explain it to people who've, who are um, not so sure. Um, now, you may have heard of something called the serverless framework. Hands up if you have. This is interactive. There's eight of you. Really? Only eight? How many of you have heard of the serverless framework? Ten. OK. Um, so we, we, we kind of have this problem within the serverless uh, community, which is there is a thing called the serverless framework, which means that everyone who looks for serverless thinks that it's the serverless framework. It's not. It's not the only way of doing it. There are various different approaches. There are things like Apex. Um, there's things, various other bits. I actually wrote a blog post uh, last week, in, last week, last year, in which I said, uh, serverless is just a name. We could have called it Jeff. Um, and to be honest, that normally gets a laugh. But you're all, no, OK. Um, so uh, the name is just a name. It's just a, a, a hook to hold on to. Um, we are not talking about the serverless framework here. We are talking about the broader approach. So. I, I kind of want to be able to tell you all of the times that you should be able to use it so you don't have to think too hard. But actually, I think that wouldn't help you because serverless is, going serverless is a different way of thinking. So I kind of need to explain the approach, get into the detail, and then give you the, the background and what you can do with it. So um, this is one of my favorite slides, simply because it says that containers are the way we used to do it. Um, the, we have always kind of looked at the way we develop systems as being about a server, a, a, an entity that is a, a Linux box usually um, in some form, either it's physical or it's virtual, or there's an instance within a bunch of other, within a physical server, or, or there's something else. There's, there's a thing, and they're all servers in the same way. And, and that kind of causes some problems as you're going forwards. You kind of think a little bit about, um, you kind of approach a problem with the idea that you have a server there every single time. Now, if you do that, actually, the leap to serverless is quite difficult because you end up not, not having your mind in the right place. You end up building a small server over here on top of your function as a service, and it isn't quite how it's meant to work, and you kind of have to understand the technologies to use them properly. Um, and 
what we've had kind of over the last 15 years is a bunch of people explaining to us that actually the best thing to do is build a framework of some description. So for web, it was something like Django or Rails. Um, and we stick that on top of a server solution. So we had eventually EC2 instances. And then Heroku came along and just chuck your code onto here, and we'll sort it out for you. Um, and we kind of haven't really changed the way that we approach, except in high-end startups and uh, enterprise level uh, situations. So they're, they're actually quite outlier cases. The majority of people who approach tech approach it from the point of view of a server. It's quite important that actually that is the key, because it's also a problem, which is that you end up having to maintain things. You always end up somewhere down the line having to maintain a server. And it's not so much fun. Uh, I worked for a, um, uh, an ISP 20 years ago, and I was a sysadmin. And I can tell you that the, what we used to do back then in terms of patching servers and sorting stuff out and having to fix problems is exactly the same things we have to do now. We haven't actually changed very much. We've just commoditized the process of doing it. And we know exactly. So when you say we're going to have 20 containers or whatever, you know exactly what you're going to have to do in terms of operations to keep those running, to manage, maintain the security. Um, when you also build these things, you, you, you're also looking at a server which isn't, you know, the system is invariably monolithic. Well, it can be small and monolithic, but it's a monolithic system because your testing process goes, we're going to build so it works in this way, and then we're just going to drop it into this other environment, and it should just work exactly the way we think. And the problem is that you end up with two things, and that's entrenched thinking. You end up thinking the same things, and actually you look at something new and go, well, that can't work. And that needs to be kind of wrenched away to get people anywhere near serverless. But also, the long-term cost of operating and managing servers is, is actually quite a lot higher than you think. Next time you go back to work, start doing a little log of how many of the things that you do are actually server maintenance things. And you will find that you're losing an awful lot of time. It's not necessarily that they're bad things. It's just identify that making the choice for a server can actually be a negative one in the long term. So when you go towards serverless, you look at function as a service, you're looking at infrastructure, and infrastructure as code, and things like that, and your cloud provider providing systems and other services. Not just your cloud provider services, but third-party services, so logging. Uh, maybe there's some specialized services in your industry, like fraud prevention, that kind of thing. Um, all of a sudden, you end up with having to manage this greater complexity. Um, and you are actually a, a lot more reliant on those third parties for, you, for the delivery of the system. Now, when you basically put your system onto a cloud, one of the things, if the cloud goes down, if S3 disappears, because it never does that, if S3 disappears, um, then you end up with a system where uh, all of a sudden the knock-on effect can mean that your system goes down. And that's, that's not what you want. But actually, I can tell you that the majority of times when I've run servers, things go down an awful lot more than when a cloud provider goes down. So do you kind of worry about that? But the thing is, you just got to worry about you know, what your users are going to think if something goes down. Can you provide a failover? Can you think about those kinds of things? But it's, it's, a, it's a thing to remember. And I'm, always, I'm all about the re reduction in maintenance. I'm all about, all about the long-term total cost of ownership of the system. But serverless is still a very new way of doing it. And, and I know that there's a lot of hesitancy. I'm just trying to decide whether I need to speed up or slow down. Is this going too slowly or too quickly? OK, yes, good. You're good, good, OK, fine. Um, so uh, serverless is still very new. It's to, it, we are in the pioneer phase at the moment. There's a bunch of us. Uh, who have jumped on, the, on this serverless bandwagon and are doing b bits and pieces, but there are actually very few companies out there doing any of this, which is why even a small company such as ours is an interesting case study for other people. Um, and because this, the uh, community is so small, that's why we're going out and doing all of these talks, even though we're not trying to sell you anything. Um, the thing is that actually the patterns are not emerging yet. We still don't know exactly how to do all of these things. We're still guessing, we're still talking, we're still playing. The community is ready to be shaped by people who jump in and have a go. So I'm just kind of advising you to have a look at it. Um, and I would say that scale is easy and hard all at once. Uh, you end up with the ability to go like this very, very quickly. 
um, without having to do anything. Uh, our systems basically went from a few thousand users to 500,000 users without really changing anything core at all. It just went, uh, and that was because our servers were right. But then we also then have to manage the complexity of the systems, and that is a problem. Um, I've spoken to a lot of CTOs about this. I have had pretty much every question you can imagine. I don't know all the answers. Quite happy to have a dialogue with you. Um, but actually, the best questions often come from those pioneers. If you're not really playing with this and, asking, um, and you're just asking questions to find out if it's worth playing with, I'm going to say, go away, have a play, and then come back with the questions. There are lots of tutorials out there to show you, um, and it's worth having a look. But CTOs are kind of the right place to play with this. It's an interesting technology. So what I'm going to do now is just jump through the various different bits and give you some pros and cons. So the function as a service, is everyone, who's played with AWS Lambda or one of the other ones? Good, a few of you. Um, it's, it's been around since 2014, but it's still a very new idea in most people's minds um, because it's so different. Uh, there is no straightforward analog to your systems that, that you run now with servers, which is why it's a little bit different. The thing is, a friend of mine told me it's a bit like crack which is you try it once, and then you try it again, and then you try it again, and all of a sudden, you can't go back to doing it the previous way. So I do kind of you know, just tell you that that happens. Um, but as I said, we're still in a pioneering phase. There's some really interesting things that you can do. Look at Apex specifically. Uh, I think there's some really interesting work going on there. But also the other technologies around uh, Apache OpenWhisk is very good for on-prem kind of stuff around this. So there are, there are services out there that are worth exploring. Now, the advantages very much are things like cost. Our costs for running large-scale systems are tiny. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how much they are. Come and ask me afterwards. I will tell you off the record. Um, but it, you would be uh, amazed at how little we actually spend. Um, we also have to think about decoupling logic. It encourages you to think about things distributedly. You end up having to design systems in a different way. Um, and one of the real advantages of using function as a service is your errors are actually contained within your system. You own, if you errors, it doesn't take a whole server down. So instead of having something happen on one server that then drops the whole thing, it then goes on to another and drops it, and then eventually your system goes down, Lambda basically takes an error. It's the one tiny bit of the whole, and that one tiny bit stops working. And it's quite nice when that happens, because you can fix that bit without having to affect anything else. Um, you also get the scale based upon how your provider does the scaling, and it's really useful. You can go from small to very big from the very beginning. Um, there aren't any really bulky frameworks out there. And what I mean by a bulky framework is that if you actually have a look at the majority of systems out there for things like web development um, based in Java or in Python or in Ruby or whatever, you actually look at the amount of code you've got there. You're actually taking uh, an extreme amount of technical debt into your system. Now, it may not feel like it because it's an open source system and it's fine, but actually you are, you are literally porting technical debt into your systems. You may be able to fix it, they may be able to fix it, but actually you never, never quite know. So once you take the idea of frameworks being reduced and actually using function as a service as your core logic and minimizing your library usage and things like that, you actually end up without that bulk and without the, the loss of those um, the, the in introduction of technical debt. So one of the things that we do a lot with is events and queues. Sometimes we can look at this as messages and message queues, um, but events are what we call them within the AWS world. Um, now, interestingly, when I started talking about this uh, and talking about serverless and how it works, one of the first people that came up to me was this old guy in his 60s, gray hair, starts talking to me about, we've already fixed all these problems. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, we already fixed them in the 80s. And he said, because we had small things that we had to talk to each other, and we had to fig figure out how to make basically lots of small bits into a distributed system. Um, but that's a hardware problem. And he said, that's where we have the point. That's where we've learned to do all of these things. So I would suggest, if you, if you have any hardware people, get them to learn some of this stuff. It's worth doing. Um, it's a, it, now, you might have heard that Doing AWS Lambda or similar is a microservices approach. I would actually disagree. I think it's different. And it's subtle, but it's very different. 
um, because it, it'll come. I'll come back to this later. But essentially, the error bound uh, the uh, error boundary is different within a microservices system to within a Lambda system, and there's probably more things to talk about later. But um, it's not the same thing. Anyone that says it is, I think they're wrong. Um, for a lot of people, this feels like a backward step. But when you start using the ideas of events and queues and um, dead letter queues and uh, queuing things, you know, FIFO queues and all of that kind of stuff, you actually end up being more efficient and you end up having a more resilient system. It's more complicated to do, but it is more resilient. And actually, you can find that um, it's easier to switch out uh, parts of a system. So if something isn't quite doing the right thing, it's actually very easy to switch one bit out without having to change the whole. Um, and I think uh, this is the key. If you can understand this, and actually a lot of people will understand this, it's just that they won't necessarily use these words and naming conventions. I think this is the key to using serverless really well. Function as a service is nice. It's just small bits of logic. But using events and queues, going back to that idea, I think is key. Now, um, when we talk about data, most people will look at this and go, well, you'll just, we'll just use a relational database, and we won't worry about that. I think that's the wrong approach. When you start to do something serverless, you're thinking about scale from the very beginning. And when you think about scale from the very beginning, uh, a relational database has actually ceased to be useful. They're good up to a certain point, and then you just have to chuck more and more stuff at it, and then manage more and more stuff. Um, you start to have to really think about things like read and write. What are you optimizing your data for? Why are you doing it? Data-driven design becomes really important at this point. And actually, you can end up with a uh, scenario where you actually have different databases to do different things, and they scale for you. So we actually have, for example, we have DynamoDB as our write database. And then when we want to do a bunch of read stuff, we push it all into S3, and we do reporting on it. We push it all into S3 and use Athena. Now, they're things you may or may not have ever heard of. But essentially, they are um, recognizing that a relational database is a uh, one-size-fits-all approach to data. And what we've done is go, well, these different bits, they need that kind of data. Maybe it's a write system. And these kinds of bits, they need read. And these kinds of bits, they're reporting bits. And we've split it up. And it may sound like more of a nightmare, but actually, it means that the system works. The system works much better. Um, the other thing is that actually it's very much more easy to understand and identify data in rest and data in motion, data at rest and data in motion, purely because you, are, you actually limit the amount of data you have, and you're not trying to do everything with one system. So I think data actually requires you um, to think more distributed, and uh, it's, it's an interesting problem to have, but it's, it's really a fun one to, to grasp, actually. So. Um, as you can probably understand, one of the big things is around this is it's not servers. Forget those until you need them. Just understand that this is an infrastructure as, cro as code problem. So for example, you can use nowadays you can use um, CloudFormation on AWS. Uh, CloudFormation wasn't very good when we started doing it, um, which was a long while ago. Um, so we picked up Terraform. Terraform has been brilliant for us. Um, and Terraform is how we run our systems and how we deploy and how we do a whole bunch of stuff around infrastructure. Um, I think if you actually looked at our Terraform, you would actually cry and go, oh my goodness, this is enormous, because it's, it, it just has to encompass the whole thing. But when you realize that it's a distributed system, you realize that actually they're all uncoupled from each other, and it makes it quite a lot more understandable. It's just that we don't really have the tooling to do this quite yet. Um, and DevOps is a kind of, it, it changes. You, your developers have to learn more ops, and your DevOps people kind of get subsumed. So it becomes, it's more of an ops dev, not a DevOps problem over time, because your ops becomes bigger. Interestingly, we found that actually it's easier to train people. It's easier to hire a junior and then explain to them about infrastructure and then say, now use the code that you've learned, you know, your Java and your JavaScript, the code that you've learned to build little bits of logic, but build me a system. Uh, and they kind of, it seems that they kind of understand it a little bit more. If you take out the idea of everything's got to be a server and you start thinking distributedly, it actually becomes a much, much better problem 
for someone who is new to try and understand it. I, I can't quite put my finger on why, but it does seem to work. Um, one of the things that is difficult is that it is harder to test. We will come on to that in a minute. Um, but essentially, uh, yes, testing is very, very different um, because of the moving parts, because you can't really test on a live system in the same way. And you can't do what you can do with containers, which is you know, have them running on your own systems. It doesn't quite work that way. Um, kind of talk a little bit about security. One of the big useful things is you're actually uh, you're, you're handing over part of your security problem to the provider. So we use API Gateway, for example, for all HTTP interaction to Lambda. So an API Gateway does a, does a lot of jobs that I don't need to now worry about, such as denial of service, m managing those. Um, uh, it you know, provides you with looking after your various cookies and load balancing and all of that kind of stuff. It does a useful job in that respect. Um, and it means that you don't have to maintain and manage. And it's not a server approach. It's a different approach. It's a service approach. Um, I think when you look at security as well, one of the things we use is AWS Cognito. Has anyone used Cognito? Anyone heard of Cognito? Two people, three, four, excellent. So a few people. Um, uh, Cognito is just basically an authentication authorization service that works with AWS's authentication management, um, identity and authentication management, I am. And uh, what it really means for me is that I can say, right, we're just going to set up a Cognito pool over here. People can log into their Cognito pool, and automatically they are a, a, uh, a user, an identity within AWS that I can now limit its interaction to just the API gateway. So instead of having to give them the server with HTTP access and all of these other things, um, all we do is go, well, that, that person's identity, all they can do is this one layer, and that just touches on, on small bits of code, small bits of logic in Lambda. So it just makes the security much, much tighter and much less able. Like, you don't get things, well, you can, but it's very difficult. You don't get things like hacking attempts in the same way. There are different types of hacking attempts. They're probably better because all of the containers that run the Lambda are short-lived. So you end up with a, a lot of security built in, which is really useful. Um, deployment tools, I've kind of talked a little bit about this already. Um, there are, one of the things we found is that deploying is pretty good. It's all right, it's exactly the same. You can use some of the tools, you can use Terraform, you can do all of these various different things, and you can create the same kind of CI, CD pipelines that you can do elsewhere. But one of the problems we've found recently is that because we have a large number of Lambda functions, if a deployment, for whatever reason, goes wrong partway through, and it can just because it's a distributed system, you can end up with half a system and half a system that are out of sync. And then how do you then upgrade and deploy something that's correct? And it's very difficult. Also, things like um, which, stage deploys is basically what I'm talking about. It's actually very hard. Uh, there aren't the tools out there to do it. So we don't have the full set of tools to be able to do all of this at the moment. Um, also, canarying, um, blue-green deployments. Uh, you kind of have to roll your own, because the way that all of the service providers have built lambdas is so that you don't have this thing that allows you to route 10% of traffic over there and 90% over there. They don't have that. Um, also, you have to um, do a lot around uh, service discovery. So the first conversation I had when I got here was about service discovery uh, as a problem. And I think you actually end up with a bigger problem with ser service discovery here. And the idea of service meshes, and uh, I've kind of written a thing about event routing so that you can have um, an ARN DNS-like scenario, so that that might be able to help. But we are in the middle of trying to figure all of these things out. But for the majority of systems, you'll be fine with the deployment tools that you've already got. But it's not a perfect system. Um, testing. We have, um, within the server world, testing is so kind of a solved problem. We know what it is. We know we do TDD. We know we do all of these other things. When you move to a distributed system, testing becomes a slightly different problem simply because your testing is different. It is very different. Now, uh, you can do an amount of unit testing very easily. That's just small bits of logic in your lambdas. Uh, when you do integration testing, you've kind of got to do a lot of mocking. It's very frustrating because you can't really run it unless you run a whole staging environment that looks exactly as your production environment. But even then, you can get caught out. 
Um, the really interesting thing is, I wrote, I wrote another blog post about this. Um, there is, I think there is a sense that uh, testing becomes different and possibly easier. It's the fact is that you can actually do unit testing on a Lambda function and then do whole system end-to-end -end testing. And actually, the bits in between, because of the, the um, test boundary around Lambdas, is actually a lot different. You don't have multiple test boundaries. Um, it's, it's, a, it's something I can talk to you a little bit more about, but actually, it's, a, it's an interesting point. To um, Testing is not necessarily better or worse. It's different. I think it's possibly a little better, but we don't have the tools yet. Uh, and really, you need infrastructure as code to be able to build your production system in a different account so that you know that you can at least test to a point with your production environment. So it, it's, it's difficult, but it's coming. Um, as I said earlier, people, I think onboarding people into the system, I think it takes a, takes a few weeks to kind of get your head around this. But if you take someone who hasn't had 15 years of working with servers and working with uh, large code bases and big monoliths, even if they're small monoliths in microservices, uh, I think it's actually easier. So possibly junior and mid-range people may actually end up being better at this because they haven't got the baggage of the large systems. And also, because you're building small bits of logic, you end up being more productive more quickly. So while this is, you know, we're not, t we're kind of going around the whole thing of serverless at the moment. Um, now, uh, let's just kind of ha have a quick pause. Um, big thing everyone talks about, because you are basically using services from one provider and you, are, you basically jump all in, um, there is vendor lock-in. However, I would argue that for the majority of cases and for the majority of systems, vendor lock-in is not a big problem. Um, the problem with vendor lock-in is that if the vendor decides they don't like you, then you, know, you have to deal with it. But if the vendor doesn't like you, I think you're not doing a very good job anyway. Um, the, the, the problem with vendor lock-in here is that you are building lots and lots and lots of things on lots of different services. And actually, you can have third-party vendor lock-in. You can have you know, your analytics maybe somewhere else, your fraud prevention maybe somewhere else, your whatever. You can have different types of vendor lock-in, whatever you do. Uh, you just have to work out whether the trade-off of having someone build the systems that you want is the right one uh, for your company. And most of the time, I would suggest, certainly within a startup environment, which is where we are, uh, we wouldn't be touching it with a barge pole. We're just going to get someone else to take the load off. And in the future, if we want to do something cool and clever and new, absolutely, we'll build it ourselves and we'll f spin out off, uh, off the vendor that we are locked into. But I, I think vendor lock-in is a little bit of a, uh, a red herring. It's a thing that really you shouldn't be worrying about. You should just pick a vendor and get on with it. Um, so the one big thing about uh, serverless for us is that you don't have to maintain very much. You have to maintain the infrastructure as code, obviously, um, but your code base is significantly smaller. It's also much less coupled. Your, if you don't do synchronous calls between Lambda functions, between function as a service systems, then your, um, your system is actually a lot less coupled than a normal system would be. It might be hundreds of functions, but because they're less coupled, there's not going to be follow-on errors and taking big bits of systems down. Um, also, you don't have to patch anything. And you don't have to, and I've already said this, but you don't have to patch anything. You don't have to worry about security updates. The provider does that for you. And trust me, that's a really nice thing, especially if you're a startup, because you can just push it out and not worry about it. In 21 months, I have had to deal with technical problems of an evening or a weekend, I think about three times three times in 21 months. We don't, have, we don't have the same kind of issues. We have different issues. We have other problems, but actually I prefer having those other problems to having to maintain servers. It's just not needed anymore. Um, so kind of, this is my kind of overall kind of pros and cons. Uh, I'll let you figure that one out. I, I think there are some really good big things, but I think we aren't there yet. It's still pioneering territory for serverless, and we're still not there yet. So where should we kind of go from here? So I've kind of given you a broad overview of what serverless is. Um, and kind of the next bit is, well, tell me how to use it. Tell me what systems are going to be good for this. So most of the time, I would suggest um, it is an appropriate solution for client-server environments. I don't think it's difficult to take it on. I don't think it's difficult to even do a small thing. I actually think it's really good for workflow management as well. So when you're trying to do 
Uh, so you, if you've ever seen anything to do with Lambda or, or any of these function as a service systems, they have a, a, a tutorial where you chuck a file into something and then they do the, the changing it into various different sizes and putting it elsewhere. Um, I don't think that's the best use case, but it's pretty good for explaining how to do various simple things. Um, I know a company that uh, does virus checking on every single one of the emails that comes into its system. So they get their email into a system, chuck it into this, and then they use Lambda to virus check whatever the attachments are. And then they say yes or no, and then go from there. I think that's a useful, you know, it's a behind the scenes workflow use case. I think there are many different ways of doing it. I can't really give you all of the systems, but I, as I say there, I think that 99% of the things we do as technologists, I think, are probably you can do them in serverless. However, there are some problems with it. Um, now, when you have a, uh, a serverless system, essentially what you're doing is running very, very small containers that are very, very quick to load. So just recognize that there's still going to possibly be, if you're cold starting, there's going to be a short time, uh, depending on the technology you choose. Java's quite slow to load up. Node is remarkably quick to load up. Um, also, if you're using something like an API gateway in the way, then that will add some latency into the system. So if you're looking at something for a real-time system, probably not the best approach. However, I would again suggest that the number of times you actually need true real-time systems is limited to a bunch of very specific use cases in a bank or somewhere like that. Um, and so you can probably still get away with it most of the time. In any kind of request response scenario in mobile, which is what we do, the network is never going to be very good and perfect. So we can always get away with a little bit of latency anyway. It's not a problem for our systems. Um, now, compute intensive. Uh, one of the things that you can't really do is, is start up a function as a service function and do a whole bunch of things very compute intensive. Because, you, you, because they limit, all of the service providers limit the size of the containers that you will load. Um, and I think that's a really good thing because it makes you start to think about running sequential and uh, parallel tasks in a different way. So instead of going, I've got this big load of stuff here and I'm just gonna chuck it at a server and it's gonna go, just gonna do it and then chuck something out at the other end. What you can actually do is go, well, this, this process is 14 different tasks. If I just pass it in at the start, and then just do those 14 tasks in sequence or, uh, or do some kind of map reduce, then you can do some interesting things. Just as a quick case in point, uh, AWS has a little uh, GitHub repo that has a um, AWS Lambda map reduce solution. Uh, it's worth looking at simply because you don't need to know anything like Hadoop. You just need to know a little bit of code. Uh, and it works quicker and uh, it's cheaper. I kind of think it's worth looking at. If you're looking at big data stuff, uh, it's, it's definitely worth looking at. But um, in terms of compute intensive stuff, you need to be looking at instances or even on, on, you know, on prem computing, you know, physical stuff. You need to be thinking about those in a different way. Um, mission critical stuff. Now, this comes back to being cloud and being super advanced cloud. Very simple. Uh, if you don't want your systems going down because AWS has, had a, uh, has, has gone wrong for whatever reason, then you're going to have to have a different solution. But know that you're going to have to manage that solution. So the trade-off is it's mission critical, but I need to manage it. Uh, if, you don't need, if it's not mission critical, you probably don't need to worry about it if it goes down on the very occasional times your cloud provider goes down. Um, so remember, with all of these things, it's still your service. You've still got to care about your users who are using it. If you, if you think your users aren't going to like it if it goes down, ever, then you're going to have to come up with a way of managing that, and that's not straightforward. Uh, failover is actually really important, but things like caching and functionality at the edge become of interest at this point. Um, and another scenario where you probably don't want to be doing it is where you need an amount of control, often for things like regulatory reasons, where you need to know exactly where something is um, for the government or whoever it is, and you actually need to be able to walk over and point at a box. Uh, that's probably not the best scenario, but you can get around some of those things if you have the right, if the providers have the right relationship with the government, for example. Um, but also where you need a specific and special configuration. So then you would be looking at containers and you would be looking at other things. Um, but the majority of those scenarios you could probably take as small parts edge cases within a whole. 
You don't switch out all of those bits for one. You know, you could, this, this is a part of the problem rather than the only way. But again, when should you use serverless? Or possibly it should be when, when could you use serverless? Probably use it most of the time. It's not quite necessarily completely ready for everybody who's, who's looking for solidity and everything else, but I think it's probably pretty much there for you know, the late pioneers and beyond uh, to really start looking at all of these things now. Um, just as a quick aside, um, as a, uh, we've, a friend of mine and I have set up a community conference. Um, and it's very, very simple, very, very straightforward. We're very cheap, and we're not making any money out of it. I just say this because we've got some very interesting speakers. Um, in, and it's in less than a month, and it's good fun. Uh, and I will be there uh, trying to tell everybody how amazing serverless is again. Um, but otherwise, when should you use a serverless approach? I'd say about 99% of the time. Thank you very much.